Today's video is sponsored by a good friend of the channel, Bootleg Greedo. Mirim versus Kazur and Ukima, Thrasios and Yoshimaru, and a Seeker, God of the Tree. No ramp in the early game there, so I have to mulligan that one. And of course, that takes us into. Oh, that's a two lander with the glass pool mimic. Uh, we could Mystical Tutor. Actually, we can't Mystical Tutor on turn one for any kind of ramp. But we'll keep that one. We can, worst case scenario, go for a Nature's Law or a three visits, and that'll take us into Kodama's Reach. Alright, excellent. And we draw on turn one, luckily, so. That gets us into a volcanic island, so I will go for the Mystical Tutor onto some ramp, I think. We see Yoshimaru on turn 1. The other partner player just deciding to play out of tap land, so we'll go Mystical Tutor in 4, the 3 visits. So drawing into that land on turn 1 made all the difference. Crack the Arid Mesa for some green mana. A legendary land in Ottawara being played into Yoshimaru. Uh, following that up with a search for Azkanta, which is a legendary enchantment, so at this jumping up to a 3-3 by turn 2. And then swinging in our direction. Yeah, we're just going to get hated by most players because people are really scared of Mirim recently. Contentious plan from the Sultai player, proliferate and draw. We draw Bloodstained Mire, so we've got plenty of lands to drop. We'll drop the land that we fetch with the Kodama's Reach here though. Or actually, it's probably a good idea to get out a shock land in tapped while we've got the chance, so play out the Bloodstained Mire. Doesn't matter if our opponents know that we've got a land to make next turn, I don't think. A Seeker playing Commander Sphere. Yoshimaru puts a delay into the graveyard, probably trying to get closer to a land with the Search for Ascanta. Playing out another legendary land, Pendlehaven this time. Followed by a legendary artifact, Celestis. So that makes it day. Not sure if that's going to be relevant or not. Playing a Noble Hierarch, the first non-legendary permanent they've played. And Yoshimaru now a 5-5 commander. See if they come back in at us. And they do not spread in the damage around this time going through to a Seeker. That does have Exalted. So it gets plus 1 plus 1 and lands 6 commander damage. Ukima Stalking Shadow being cast. And now drawing into a Crucible of the Spirit Dragon. So... Uh, Let's throw that into play. Probably not the wisest move to go for our commander here. But if we do, we could get down a couple of Atsushis next turn. Um, either way, we're casting this next turn. We're probably encouraging the Yoshimaru to swing in towards us. Yeah, but there's nothing else we can do this turn other than the Atsushi, and I'd rather get a couple of those. So play out the Mirim with no protection whatsoever. If we don't draw into anything really good next turn, and we keep our commander, we can go Atsushi and then make a copy of the non-legendary version with Glass Pool Mimic. We could even make a copy of the legendary version and just bin the Glass Pool Mimic. To get the triggers, we'll exile the top two cards, most likely. Explosive Vegetation for a Seeker. Nothing going into the bin from the search for Azkanta this time. Arcane Signet from the partner player. And following that up with Elspeth Resplendent. So, at Legendary puts a plus counter on the Yoshimaru. Then looking at the top 7 cards, you can put a permanent with mana value 3 or less from amongst them onto the battlefield with a shield counter. The rest go on the bottom. Ugh, managing to get into Oko, that is so unlucky for us. So we lose our commander. Oh wow, alright, going for making a food token with the Oko, that's very surprising. I thought our commander was a goner there. I'd definitely be using Ukima to swing in at the Oko and remove that shield counter. I assume shield counters work with planeswalkers. Keeping seven cards in hand and playing Kazur Ruthless Stalker. If they want the plus counter on Okima they'll have to deal damage to a player but I'd definitely be knocking the shield counter away from Oko here. Ah, but instead, leaving the Oko in play, maybe they're assuming that the plus on Oko is going to go on the Mirim, which is probably a safe assumption. So, uh, with them hitting us, that triggers the Ukima, puts a plus counter over there. And we do draw into another land, so uh, Haven of the Spirit Dragon this time. So, play the Haven. Can't afford the Ubara Hellkite, so it'll have to be the Atsushi. 
So play out the Atsushi, we will get a non-legendary version of that. Oh, actually, I forgot about the Ward 2 on Mirim, so if they'd gone for turning this into an Elk, or Oko turning our commander into an Elk, it would have been countered thanks to the Ward, so... Yeah, we'll probably see it next turn, but we'll have at least had some damage dealt there already. Let's go for the Glass Pool Mimic. So we'll have that come down as a copy of the non-legendary token, so that we don't have to get rid of it. And then that will trigger the Mirim again, so we've got a bunch of Atsushis here. So we'll be able to make a whole heap of treasures. Uh, probably six treasures, and then... Or maybe we just make three treasures and exile a bunch of stuff off the top. Omniscience only lets us cast things from our hand for free, which is noteworthy. But we'll be able to get out Omniscience, if that is what the next round of plays is going to be. Anyway, we don't know yet. We'll see what happens. Mirim has to swing in at Oko here. Could have got rid of the Elspeth, but the Ukima leaving two Planeswalkers in play don't think is a very good idea. Oops, there's nothing we can do about their attacks. Oh, shield counters don't work with Planeswalkers, all right. I thought that the shield counter would fall off and no damage would be dealt there, but alright, that's really good that we managed to keep our commander in play then. Seeing the Prismatic Bridge enter play here, so we know it's a Prismatic Bridge deck as opposed to an Asika one. Then playing Rampant Growth, four cards left in hand. Once again leaving the card on top with the enchantment. Elspeth ticking up, going to give Yoshimaru a plus counter and then either a Flying Life Link. Vigilance or First Strike counter. Probably Vigilance would be a good idea. Uh, they decide, I don't know what that is, Vigilance. They put a Vigilance counter on there. And the 7-7 Yoshimaru swinging in for the first time towards Ukima and Kazur. Landing 9 commander damage there thanks to the Exalted. And then Elspeth conquers death. Exile a permanent with mana value 3 or greater. So, yeah, able to pay the ward on that. They go after the Mirim. Sultai Banner from the Sultai Player. Not doing too well on mana over there. Then playing a Blighted Agent. Infect and can't be blocked. Which obviously is relevant when you're throwing plus counters around. See if they ignore the Elspeth again. Because her swings in at the Asika Player. And yep, yeah, the Ukima does swing in at Elspeth. That's good. Source to Plowshares. Onto the Blighted Agent before it gets to do any Infect damage whatsoever. So now each of the commanders has a plus counter on there. I think we might just be replaying our commander here because it would be good to uh, go for Uvara Hellkite into our commander. And we do get into another land, so that's a chance for us to get down our commander this turn. Then maybe we get to play Omniscience next turn. Although we'll have to remember that Omniscience into this, it's going to cost two more. Hmm. So we'll have to see that. Anyway, it's Verdant Catacombs. We can get out a tap land with that, maybe? No, it has to be an untapped land for our commander, doesn't it? So get our commander back into play again and hope that it makes it round another turn cycle. And then I'll swing in eight points of damage towards the Yoshimaru before they give their Yoshimaru flying as a punishment for getting rid of our Mirin before. They also haven't been dealt any damage yet. Prismatic Bridge, largely being left alone here. We'll see how much good stuff they get before people start paying attention over there. Uh, Alright, didn't get anything great. An Evolution Sage. You really ought to build the Prismatic Bridge as only high-level creatures and planeswalkers from like 6 CMC, maybe 5 CMC and up, so that you always get into something good. Um, Evolution Sage suggests that this is a Planeswalker build, but probably wouldn't have included that, so they don't feel as though they've whiffed. There's plenty of instants and sorceries that can proliferate for you. And there we see a Kaya's Wrath, so here is where the Atsushi becomes relevant. Our commander back into the command zone again. He's now going to cost us 10 mana. So let's keep challenging our opponents to remove the mirror and we'll make three treasure tokens a couple of times and then we'll exile a couple of things twice as well. Uh, not seeing any lands there, which is unusual for this game. Reflections of Lityara, a Core Lesser, Parallel Lives and a Savage Ventmore. Tatyova being thrown into the bin by the Azkanta. Yeah, this is going to be relevant. Non-creature spells costing two more. 
because I was hoping we'd be able to go for both Reflections and Parallel Lives, but that'll be 6, uh, 13 mana, I think. Yoshimaru back into play again. Uh, so what can they reanimate with this? It's either a creature or Planeswalker, so we could see any of these Planeswalkers again next turn. And Evolution Sage coming down over here as well. Then dropping a land. Not going to be able to proliferate on the Yoshimaru. They can proliferate on the Saga though. So uh, yeah, that will get rid of that. Bringing back the Elspeth Resplendent. Puts a plus counter on Yoshimaru and extra loyalty counter on the Elspeth. And then minusing down on that straight away to try and get a free permanent. Uh, yeah, just got a land there. That was Okina Temple of the Grandfathers. Legendary creature gets plus one plus one for green and a tap. That does proliferate for them, so they get a shield counter on this. Another loyalty counter, another plus counter. And then playing out Thrasios Triton Hero, which is obviously... A legendary, another plus counter on the Yoshimaru. The Sultai player not doing anything there, holding up. It is six mana they're holding up, so we'll assume it's not a rift. The Celestus was triggering there, so it does become knight. They gain a life and draw a card, discard a card. Uh, Thassa has ended up in the bin at some point, so I'm assuming they looted. They've got one card in hand. Okay, just drawing into another land in Sulphur Falls, so throw out the Sulphur Falls. Now, I don't think I'm willing to go for both Parallel Lives and the Reflections of Lityara because they're just going to cost too much. Each of them cost two extra, don't forget, thanks to the Saga. Parallel Lives with our Commander can give us extra Legendaries, so that's probably the way to go here. So I'll play out the Parallel Lives. Uh, they are holding up priority over here, allowing that down. I want the Savage Vent more as well. Argument to be made for us paying the extra mana to get down Reflections of Lityara, but this thing will kill off extra legendaries that it brings in. So, three treasure counters we're left with. Should be able to get down our commander next turn. I just need to land our commander and leave it in for a turn cycle so that we can drop the Omniscience, which we're not necessarily going to be able to do. So having to let the Core Lesser go, unfortunately. Eh, maybe it's worth playing the Core Lesser, because we'll be able to afford both our Commander and the Omniscience either way, even without these treasure tokens. Uh, yeah, let's go for it. So we end up with one mana left over. Maybe maybe should have gone for the Reflections of Lityara. We could have had a couple of extra dragons here. Although Core Lesser is a legendary, I didn't realise, so obviously only would have kept one of those. Top of our library is a Garrix Uprising, by the way, which, if we keep Savage Ventmore in play, will draw us a card. Celestus triggering once again. Going to draw a card and loot, potentially. And they did go for that, so reality chip being binned. Yeah, and this is the problem. If you put creatures like this in, an, uh, in a Prismatic Vista deck, then you're likely going to be flipping into them. You really want to be putting only big, scary creatures and planeswalkers in. So they get a Sakura Tribe Elder. I think my Prismatic Bridge list is like 60% mana. Non-creature based mana, cultivates and all that. And then the other 40% is big planeswalkers and creatures. I'm going for a spell here anyway. Four cards in hand. Yep, yeah, and another board wipe. Time wipe, return a creature to hand and then destroy all creatures. So they're helping to leave the Elspeth in play. But at least we didn't get our commander blown up again there. Replaying the Sakura Tribe Elder. Then during combat on a Seeker's turn, destroy target, artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying at the end of the turn. So, uh, yeah, that's... It was pretty risky letting them flip into what could have been much worse. But this way, they miss the trigger next turn and have to spend pretty much all their next turn recasting this. So, yeah, it sort of buys you two turns in a weird way. Search for Azkanta triggering again. Got plenty of cards in the bin. And they do flip it round to Azkanta the Sunken Ruin. Tamiyo, Collector of Tales for Yoshimaru and Thrasios. And they're returning Elspeth Conquer's Death to hand there, so bringing back the Saga. Could cast it here, maybe want to get rid of the Parallel Lives. Plenty of removal this game. And yep, yeah, that's exactly what they go after. Exiling our Parallel Lives. So obviously in hindsight, if we'd known a board wipe was coming, 
So the Savage Vent more, you would have got out the Reflections of Lit Yara. We would have had either one of those left in play. But this Saga doing some work here. And they're minusing down with the Elspeth. That has done a lot of work here as well. Going to get them another permanent potentially. That got them into Baby Teferi, the Time Raveller. Return up to one artifact, creature or enchantment to its owner's hand. Draw a card. So actually bounce the Sakura Tribe Elder there. This player must have been F6. So um, yeah, they didn't sacrifice it in response like they maybe should have done. And once again, this seems to happen quite a lot with this Mirim deck. We do seem to miss haste quite a lot, even though we've got a decent number of haste enablers. Flesh Eater Imp, Flying and Infect, also has a Sack Outlet. They may well have Counter Magic as well, because they're holding up three mana over here. Okay, so... Hmm. I'll drop a land. Our commander costs ten. I'd rather our commander gets countered than the Omniscience. Garrick's Uprising, if we're really lucky and chain a bunch of dragons, could keep us in cards. We'll get us closer to some relevant stuff, so... Yeah, let's just try the Mirim again. Although, saying that, this is going to make it so that we can't cast our Omniscience next turn. Alright, let's try Omniscience. If we don't land this, we're probably not doing anything this game. We could always make a land next turn and still be able to afford the Omniscience thanks to that treasure, but... Yeah, I'm not going to hold my breath on that. The Soul Time player was holding up priority there, but decided against um, doing anything about the Omniscience. So they might be able to remove something in response before we can get down the Hellkite, but we'll go for the Garrick's Uprising for free first. Because we do want to draw cards here. Still holding up priority. Could have more enchantment removal. We've only got one card in hand, so I'm not sure I would really worry about I think people get tunnel vision and just really worry about Mirim. Um, I know Uvara Hellkite's really good, but like I say, it's one card in hand and we've got an army of planeswalkers that need to be dealt with here. So I think they should be letting us do stuff here. Cast the Uvara Hellkite for free. Hopefully draw a card. Okay, that is allowed to enter, so Garrick's Uprising probably going to draw us into a land. A Rishkar's Expertise or something like that would be superb here. Yep, Temple of the Dragon Queen. So we'll just have to leave it there and hope that we can actually do something next turn, but I'm not going to hold my breath. We can at least cast our commander, hopefully, into the Garrick's Uprising. Not often that you can drop an Omniscience and do nothing with it. Now set Parter of Veils for the Super Friends player. Okay, the Sultai player tapped down a couple of blue mana there, which is surprising, so... Yeah, it might be that they do have counter magic, but decided to leave the omniscience alone. Now set minus is down anyway, revealing a D spark, which can easily deal with anything that they deem a problem on our side of the field. And of course, it goes on to the omniscience. I'll be very, very intrigued to see if the um, Yoshimaru and Thrasios player wins this one, because I think we're drawing a hell of a lot of hate from our opponents. It's not to say you should leave an omniscience in play, but. Yeah, when you're top decking, and it should be obvious that we have a land in hand, I think. Because otherwise we would have just cast something for free, wouldn't we? I suppose we could have had an instant or sorcery that wasn't relevant to us. Getting down a Sahili Sublime Artificer, and replaying that Sakura Tribe Elder. Uh, they just plussed on the Teferi here, they're plussing on the Tamio as well. Three cards in hand, so we'll see if they get what they name. They named Swords to Plowshares, still have only three cards in hand, so I don't think they got the swords there. That looks a bit too much like Supreme Verdict mana for my liking, so I'm just praying that it's not the uh, third board wipe are we on now. Then deciding to untap the mana. Yoshimaru back into play once again, they have uh, one, two, three, four mana held up. Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath being cast after that. So they will draw a card, potentially get another land drop here. Got themselves into a Makokoro, which we might be able to make use of over the course of the next few turns, because we're not doing too well here. That is legendary, so a plus counter on Yoshimaru. Obviously a plus counter went on from the Uro as well. Atoski's been binned at some point, not sure how that happened. I'm sure the eagle-eyed amongst you will be able to... Uh, Work that one out. Beast Within goes on to, for 5 mana, the Elspeth conquers death. So looking to not have things reanimated there. And then you would assume the Infector is going to 
Yeah, if they finish off the Elspeth, that would be good. And then I will finish off Tamio. Or maybe I just have to get rid of Narset, annoyingly. Ugh. I mean, maybe we'll get into Haste next turn, but... I mean, Haste is pretty useless when we can't cast any creatures into it. Problem with having the Narset in play is that we're not going to be able to draw additional cards from the Garrix Uprising, and we're already doing pretty bad, so... Yeah, they'll be able to minus this down, get the Elspeth back, and then get even more free permanents out of it. Yeah, our opponent's here still. Who's this one? This is the um, the enchantment player, the prismatic bridge player. Still has tunnel vision towards the dragon player. Absolutely no threat assessment going on whatsoever. Just solely focused on the guy who has a dragon in play and one card in hand. So, uh, oh wow, that has flying. Must have been given flying from the Elspeth. So we actually can't get through there anyway. So that goes down to a 5-5. Uh, yeah, we'll see what we draw into here. Probably a land. Uh, Alright, Guardian Project. So we... Hmm. We're setting up for our commander next turn. Which is really painfully slow. So we could... It's probably a better idea to just get down the commander here and actually get some bodies into play. Let's play the temple. That will come in tapped. We will name red with that. Oh, it doesn't come into play tapped. I thought we had to reveal a dragon with this. Um, right. We do have Trample on the Utvara Hellkite, but yeah, this unfortunately has one toughness too much. I really don't like leaving this player in play, and this, this player's already uh, got the, uh, the blinkers in our direction, but they're going to have even more of a disdain towards us here. We're going to get rid of their Narset just for the sake of drawing a card off the Mirim. Five Planeswalkers in play and constant board wipes going on, so yeah, it's difficult to get rid of them in combat. Uh, not going to draw a card to the Garrick's Uprising, thanks to the Narset. Uh, yeah, and I've actually changed my mind now. Mm, I just think we're just going to have Mirim removed straight away. They're already looking at the Utvara Hellkite, I think. Maybe some opponents are looking at using us to get rid of some of these Planeswalkers, which they should be doing, really, if they can't land creatures. If that's the case, we'll be able to make use of a Guardian Project. Draw two cards from the Mirim next turn. So I'm not going to go for the Commander here. That costs us six mana because of the Saga. So Guardian Project allowed in play. I'll just put a Storage Counter on the Crucible. And we will pass the turn at that. Prismatic Bridge being replayed again. That will make a servo token from Sahili. Not see enough of Sahili, Sublime Artificer, but it's an excellent token producer. Sacrificing the Sakura Tribe Elder as well. The Ukima player decides to scoop it up there. Uh, the Tamiyo Manus is down regardless. Once again going after the Elspeth Conquer's death. So this is where we see the back of Utvara Helkai, I imagine. So replaying that saga once again. And yeah, that goes on the Hellkite. In all fairness, we haven't actually seen all that much of a threat from the Prismatic Bridge this game. Because I don't think they've built the deck entirely optimally over there. Elspeth is... Choose a target creature, put a plus counter on it, and another type of counter. So that goes back up to a 6-6 and now has First Strike and Flying. Plusing on the Baby Teferi as well. The uh, Beast swings in towards the Servo at the um, Planeswalker... And then Yoshimaru swinging in at Sahili as well. We get the Uro. So just going to take the damage here. <laughs> and then... Yep. Early scoops on Magic Online. Completely screws our game up. Then bounces. <laughs> so it's Smothering Tithe. For the partner player here. And a Training Grounds ready for their Thrasios. We'll make that cost two less. So let's see if we can actually do something this game. Alright, a Goldspan Dragon that has haste. Not going to be paying into the Smothering Tithe. So let's throw down the Mirim once again. Because we'll go for the Goldspan Dragon next turn. We've got Command Attacks held up for Mirim as well. We draw a card from Guardian Project and from the Garrick's Uprising. This is going to play into the Smothering Tithe, unfortunately. They got that down at the perfect time where we actually start to draw cards. Uh, say no to both of those because we want to hold up the Heroic Intervention here. Uh, Cloth's Will as well could be useful. Probably not. They've got some big creatures there. So let's swing in and finish off the Elspeth. 
two cards in hand, so not as likely that they'll do something about that. Elspeth goes down again, but will likely come out with the Elspeth Conquer's death in a turn or two. So spells are going to cost two more here. Uh, oh, and actually forgot about the Teferi Time Raveler static ability, so we actually can't go for the um, heroic intervention here anyway. So, in that case, just going to allow that to resolve. Maybe should have got rid of the Teferi. Thrasios into play, three cards in hand. Then Kodama of the West Tree after that, so they'll get a bit more ramp when they turn in sideways with these two creatures, because I'm not going to be blocking. Uh, oh, Yoshimaru is only a 5-5 with Trample, so uh, they're still swinging in. Uro going to trigger, because that swings in as well. Uh, oh, they've got the Pendlehaven, haven't they? So they wouldn't mind trading us the Mirim for their Yoshimaru. We'll just take the 11 damage here, I think. So we get whacked by both of those. They'll get to ramp with the Kodama of the West Tree a couple of times. Not worthy that this has reach, so we might have to put a bunch of mana into a Cloth's Will before we swing in. They play down, they've got Biomancer's Familiar and the Training Grounds now, which is really good with their Thrasios. So they can actually just do it for free, infinitely there. Getting into a land once again, Smothering Tithe, say no. Play out the Reflecting Pool. So we hold up 5 mana for the Gold Span Dragon, that will get us a treasure this turn for the Heroic Intervention. So then we've got 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, and then 3 into X, because it will cost 2 more. And then we can blow up 3 enchantments and or artifacts. Yeah, let's just go for the gold span dragon first. Might be able to draw into some relevant stuff here. So uh, Mirim, going to trigger, as is the Garrick's Uprising. Guardian Project only triggers on the non-token versions. Alright, that could be relevant. Dockside Extortionist, especially with all those treasures being made. Say no to that, that'll actually help us, strangely. Mana Crypt as well, while we're teetering on a low life total. Mirin makes a copy of the Goldspan Dragon, which, like I said, triggers the uh, Garrick's Uprising. So, actually starting to draw cards here by turn 11. Sarkham's Triumph, is that relevant? Mana Crypt is going to cost us 2, and just tap down for 2. So it's not really worth doing here. Um, we'll play the Dockside Extortionist. And each of the Dockside Extortionists will tap for a bunch of mana. Thanks to the two Goldspan Dragons. They're doing something in response here. Uh, Alright, just cracking a food token. So that will get us a treasure token. Draw another card with the Guardian Project. I think they cracked a treasure token in response to the uh, cracking of the food as well. Uh, we get five treasures. Say no to Smothering Tithe, we drew into a land which we can't play here. We don't have Haste, which is the annoying thing. Um, could go for Old Norbone and then dump a load into Cloth's Will. That might be the thing to do. So we'll go at Sarkin's Triumph. That costs us 5 mana. The uh, multiple Goldspan Dragons actually don't matter, it's not an additional mana, it just says specifically that the uh, treasures tap for 2 mana apiece, so... Having multiple gold span dragons doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, so just looking through all these, I mean, we could grab a dragon that has haste. I was looking at the brood mother to really pile on the pressure on our opponent, but I think just old Norbone and the big X spell will be the way to go here. So we'll cast the old Norbone. It costs one mana to activate the Thrasio, so it isn't infinite like I said it was before. Forgot that training grounds can't reduce it to less than one, can it? Yeah, Biomancer says that as well, so it does cost one for the Thrasios. They're doing it a second time here. And a third, making sure to hold up their blue mana. And again, getting a land into play that is a tapped shock land. I think they got the Gaia Reach Sanitarium there as well. Activating Thrasios again. They've got a Treasure and a Celestis available to them. So that successfully lands. We'll draw more cards thanks to Guardian Project and the Garrick's Uprising. Alright, and that's what we've wanted all game, Return of the Wild Speaker. Going to continue saying no to the Smothering Tithe. Argument to be made for us paying for that, because we're hoping that we're going to make a bunch of treasures in a minute. Anyway, another Old Norbone comes into play, and that draws us into Rhythm of the Wild, which isn't going to give our current summoning sick creatures haste, annoyingly. 
It's maybe something to get down this turn. We'll see how the turn plays out, but maybe something to get down this turn so that our dragons aren't counterable next turn. Now let's just double check here. No reach. No reach. Yeah, only the Kodama has reach, and we definitely want to see the back of Teferi. So maybe throw three creatures in there, just in case there's spot removal. Yeah, let's risk them keeping the Teferi. Yeah, pretty risky, but I think if they had spot removal, they would have used it by now. So gold span dragons, each trigger. We'll get a couple more treasure tokens, each tapping for two mana. Looks like we're going to be allowed through here. All right, and there we go. So there are two rounds of six damage per old Norbone. And obviously there's two old Norbones, so we get a hell of a lot of treasures here. Now then, if we can draw into Terror of the Peaks, we could actually maybe get rid of our opponent here. Yeah, maybe we should go for that. Oh, I accidentally clicked the Mana Crypt and played it out for two mana. Well, that's a waste of mana. Uh, tap these treasures down. We're going to get Rhythm of the Wild out here so that we can't have our creatures counted. Or actually, that costs two more, doesn't it? Yeah, I want to try and maximise the amount of mana we've got, so I'll just go for the Return of the Wild Speaker, and if they counter that, then it's going to clear away for Cloth's Will at least. So we'll try and draw ourselves seven cards here. All right, we do manage it. They didn't go for the Thrasios there. Uh, going to say no, a bunch of time to Smothering Tithe. Okay, and we've actually got Cloudstone Curio with a Dockside in play, so I think it's actually worth playing Rhythm of the Wild after all that. Play that out for 5 mana, making sure our creatures can't be countered. And now they're going to start doing stuff. So it's scrying with the Thrasios again. And then allowing that into play, we'll go for the Great Henge, which will cost 4 mana as opposed to 2. Letting that down, we'll gain 2 life, tap that down for 2 straight away. Cloudstone Curio. Okay, that is allowed down as well. Now we can go for the Scourge of Valkus, and that will bounce the Dockside Extortionist back to us. Not worthy that this can't be countered now, so they will activate Thrasios a bunch of times here, I imagine. Okay, and that is a Nature's Claim straight onto the Cloudstone Curio, so that's as good a time as any to go for Heroic Intervention. This is why I wanted to get rid of the Teferi. That will cost us four mana to do it, though. Gives everything we currently have in play hexproof and indestructible. Then activating the Thrasios in response before that resolves. Got eight treasures left and they're just going to do this multiple times I imagine. They're down to their last two treasure tokens here. It's looking fairly promising for us. <laughs> Alright, they've managed to get in two swords to plowshares. So, that switches off the infinite. Don't think there's anything we can do about that. We could save it with the cloth's will but I don't think there's a means of us fishing it out of the graveyard anyway yeah it would have been nice to get into some of our flicker effects we drew a hell of a lot of lands off that big card draw spell uh yeah don't see that there's anything we can do here we'll just have to let that go what we could have done there was infinitely bounced and replayed both the dockside and the scourge of Valkus, and that would have um yeah that would have allowed us to just ping our opponent to death Anyway, we keep the Cloudstone Curio, so we can still draw a bunch of cards here if we want to. Have that enter with a plus counter on it, the haste doesn't matter. That comes in with a plus counter on it, thanks to Rhythm of the Wild. Plus counter on it, thanks to the Great Henge as well. Actually put Cloudstone Curio on the stack, because I want to draw a bunch of cards before we make a decision on what we bounce. We'll still just try and ping our opponent down to near enough nothing here. Scourge of Valkus going directly on them. That hits them for 24. We get another Scourge of Valkus into play. So uh, that triggers both of the Scourge of Valkuses. And yeah, we're just going to point these at our opponent. Pretty sure we've got it here. Draw a card from the Garrix Uprising. That is from the token entering. What do you know? It's another land. I think might be safe to start. All right, and our opponent scoops there. Yeah, I was just going to pay into the Smothering Tide there. Uh, Cloudstone Curio bounces um, the Goldspan Dragon most likely, then we can get the Goldspan Dragon untapped. Uh, we were, well let's just draw a bunch of cards here if the client will allow it. Of course it won't, so yeah, we were going to draw a whole bunch of cards there. Uh, bounce the Goldspan Dragon, we replay the Goldspan Dragon, 
That would then allow us to bounce the Scourge of Valkus, which would then be replayed and draw us a whole bunch more cards. And the whole time we're making Scourge of Valkuses an extra Goldspan Dragons, and that's a whole heap of damage in our opponent. Uh, thanks to all the treasure tokens we were able to make off the um, Dockside Extortionist, we were able to get the victory. Pretty sure that was a good top deck from the Dockside Extortionist. I'm pretty sure we top decked that. Anyway, really didn't think that we were going to do anything that game, but once again, what's the mantra on this channel? You don't quit early, and that is why. If you want to keep seeing more from Miriam, Sentinel Wyrm, then let me know. I'm Tribal Kai. Thank you for watching.